So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to talk a bit more about iterators and I'm going to walk through some examples with you. So just to kind of reiterate, uh, I'm not going to go through this in great detail because we've already talked about it in the overview section, but I'll just give you a quick summary. And if you if you want a quick synopsis of what iterators do, read the comments in this file. This is the uh, 4.1a file in my section S-04 in the STL folder in my C++ folder in my GitHub repository. So basically, it's the iterator pattern. You can do kind of three or four things with it. You can start at the beginning uh, or the end if you have something other than an input iterator, like you have a bidirectional iterator. You can advance to the next element. You can reference the value that is pointed to by the iterator, and you can check to see if you're done. So those are the key elements that are supported by, by iterators in general, and of course C++ is, is no different. And under the hood, naturally, they implement all these things by overloading C++ operators like dereference and plus plus and minus minus and so on and so forth, or equal and not equal. And, and that way, we can make these look as much as possible like pointer arithmetic, which is familiar to people who come from the world of C, at least, if nothing else. And uh, so you can think of iterators as kind of smart pointers that keep state and keep track of where they are, but they look and feel a lot like, like regular pointers. And there's a whole pile of different categories of different types of iterators. And these are the kinds of operations you get for pretty much all the iterators. You can dereference, you can plus plus, both uh, pre and post plus plus, pre decrement, post, uh, sorry, pre-increment, post-increment, you can assign, you can check for equality and inequality. For bidirectional iterators, you can also add the minus minus operation to go backwards as well as to go forwards. And then random access iterators take everything else that are pointer arithmetic operations like plus equal, minus equal, plus and minus, subscript, the relational operations, and also make those work as well. Only a handful of containers actually support the random access iteration category, but uh, it's, it's a very powerful category indeed. Now, the way you get access to these things are through the begin and end factory methods. And there's also, you know, like C begin and C end and R begin and R ends. So that's why I put a little star there. So there's actually a whole series of different factory methods that give you different kinds of iterators. The begin and end iterators give you iterators that, um, depending on what you've got, might allow you to read and write to the elements. If you use C begin, you, you get a const iterator that only lets you read to the elements but not write to them, or read from the elements, not write to them. And of course, if you use the R begin and R end factory methods, you get so-called reverse iterators. And we'll talk more about those later. You're perfectly, you know, perfectly able to write your own iterators if you need to. That's not very common, but it's certainly something that you can do. And uh, if you define your own containers, of course, you will define your own iterators. And you'll be doing that in assignment number four in our course, because you're going to write some iterators for the uh, array that you did, the array list class you do for assignment three. You'll be writing iterators to iterate through them in assignment four. So here, again, is just uh, a very simple reincarnation of the copy algorithm I stuck it in my own little namespace to avoid conflicts with the real STL copy algorithm, which comes out of the algorithm a header file. And as we've talked about many times, it just allows you to walk through an input iterator range from beginning to end, and then copy the contents to the output iterator. And we'll take lots of look at, at this as we go through the examples. So here's a very, very simple iterator example. We'll look at lots more examples, but this is just one to kind of kick things off. So in this case, we're going to create a vector of strings, and these are going to be the names of whatever's passed in on the command line to this program. Let's say it's projects or whatever. And so the program, as you can see, the main function takes argc, which is the argument count, and argv, which is the argument vector. And the argument vector is basically going to be an array of character pointers, which point, of course, to the strings that are passed in on the command line for the program. Uh, programs always take argv sub zero, or they always have a count of at least one, which is the name of the program that's being run. So what we're going to do in this case is we're going to iterate from one up to less than argc. So we're going to skip over the first element, which is always the name. And we're going to go ahead and 
subscript into argv sub i, make that into a string, and then we're going to call the emplace back operation. And emplace back is this super cool optimization that's done on a vector, which will go ahead and create this string in place without having to do any extra copies or assignments or anything like that. So now we're going to have a vector of command line arguments that have been turned into C++ strings. And then just for kicks, we're going to start at the beginning and go to the end of that vector using its iterator mechanisms. And every step along the way, we're going to write out the contents that we had passed in. Now, this program is sort of mindlessly simple, but uh, it's an example of the kinds of things that you can do with, with STL and, uh, and iterators. So this is, again, just going to be kind of overview, giving you more conceptual foundation for what iterators do. So uh, I think you probably figured out by now, C++ provides a bunch of iterators out of the box for the various standard containers in STL. Uh, so things like list, vector, Q, uh, deck, and so on. And there's also some iterators that are defined for the sort of non-container classes, the STL-like classes, such as the C++ string class. The key thing that STL iterators have for the containers is the ability to store state. So obviously, if you're going to be iterating through a vector, you have to know where you are in the vector to be able to iterate through it properly. Or if you're iterating through a set or a map, you have to know where you are in the context of the tree and so on, the, the red-black tree that's used to implement set or, or map. And there's base classes for iterators defined in the header file iterator. And we'll take a look at some of these things here shortly. So um, basically, we're going to show some examples here that illustrate how vectors work with their iterators. So you're going to get access to the iterator by using the factory method begin. You can advance using plus plus. I recommend sticking with the pre-increment plus plus when it doesn't matter for reasons that will become clear when, when you write your own implementation. And then you can get the value of the iterator by the dereference operation. So here's a, a little function we're going to use to show off some cool things about iterators called print const. And you can see here it takes a const vector of int by reference. And then down here, we go ahead and define ourselves a vector of ints. And you can see this is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So it's got nine elements in it. And then we're going to go ahead and march through this thing from beginning to end by getting ourselves an iterator to the beginning of the vector. We keep going while we're not at the end. And then every time through, we write the value. And we can then increment by one. Now, notice because we're using begin here, and because this is not a const vec, then we can actually change the elements in the vector if we so choose. You'll also notice that the C++ uh, C Lion IDE is encouraging me to move to a range-based for loop. It wants to rewrite the code like this. And uh, that, of course, is perfectly reasonable thing to do except for the fact I'm trying to show you how the iterators work. So that uses iterators under the hood, but we're going to look more explicitly at how they work first before we start talking about cool range-based for loop optimizations. Um, just for kicks, if we wanted to tweak things a bit, we could change this to C begin and C end. And then we would have a problem because this is not a const iterator. So I could say const iterator. And now that part works, but now all of a sudden, we're trying to increment of const value. So that would be a no-no. We couldn't do that. Um, a couple, so let's change it back here. Another little thing to note here, if I don't want to go all the way to a full-blown for each or a for range-based for loop, I could always change this to auto, which is a little bit more concise, a little bit less uh, carpal tunnel syndrome inducing. And that would have the same behavior as if I did this. So that uses what's called C++ type deduction. So um, one thing to remember is you never want to actually dereference the end iterator. So whatever is returned from end is not intended to be dereferenced. Do not dereference it. Do not say, you know, v.end and assign it to an iterator and then say star iterator. That's going to cause you problems. It's just meant to indicate the element that's one past the last value in whatever range that we're iterating over. And uh, 
the way that this is, this is very important to remember. And it's easy because all the iterators, all the algorithms work expecting that behavior. So here's an example where you can call sort, you give it the beginning iterator and one past the end, and then that will go ahead and sort the underlying vector. And the reason for this semantic is just to mimic the behavior of, of pointer arithmetic on native C and C++ arrays, which, which have the same characteristic. You, you can get a pointer to one past the end of the array and then use that as a loop control. So now that we've shown how to do the loop, let's go ahead and call the print const method. And let's go look at the print const method. Remember, print const takes in the iterator as a const vec ref. And the reason for doing that is we're not going to need to make a copy of this. We're just going to print it. So making a copy would be overkill. Um, but we still want to make sure that nobody tries to change anything. So we define this as a const vector. Well, when you do a const vector, then you have to make sure that you use a const iterator. And in fact, that's what I do here. I say vector in colon colon const underscore iterator. If I get rid of const, then it's going to complain and say, uh, hey, dude, you can't assign a const vectors begin operation to a non-const iterator, because that would make it possible to do something horrible like this, which we don't want to be able to do, because um, it's const. So that's one thing to remember. If I go ahead and make this auto like that, it will be in a const iterator, even though we used auto. And it probably even a better idea to be explicit here and say, C begin and C end. And that way I have denoted the fact that this really is a const iterator. Before I was taking advantage of C++'s ability to realize it needs the const version of this because it's a const object and you can only call const methods or const member functions on const references or const objects. But just to be even more kind of belt and suspenders overt about it, Let's try to use C begin and CN consistently. And again, as I said before, because this is a const iterator, you can't use it as an L value. It has to appear in a uh, situation where you can read it, but not write to it. We go ahead and create a vector of strings that say hello world. And then we kind of show the same idea. We're going to make ourselves a, a const iterator to go through this vector of strings because we're just going to read from it and we're going to print out the size of each element and then print out the contents itself and then we're going to go ahead and use this finally with a, a range-based for loop which is what the compiler has been trying to tell us to do the whole time uh, it really wants us to get rid of these explicit iterators and move to this range-based for loop approach which is what we get if we do this down here okay so that's the program. Let's go ahead and run it, and we'll see what it does. And you can see what it does is it goes ahead and prints the contents. So what we're going to do now is talk about the concept of iterator traits. And these are very important to indicate to C++ and its generic programming wizardry what type of iterator category we have. And so there's a bunch of traits that iterators can have uh, and, and that can be used to describe them as sort of metadata, if you will. And the types of categories you can have are input iterator, output iterator, forward iterator, bidirectional iterator, or random access iterator. Those are the different kinds of traits. And they, it's basically a way to carry that information around with the iterators so that various algorithms that care about this can use them accordingly. There's also something called the value type, which is a trait that indicates what type this is actually dealing with. So it might be an iterator to an int or an iterator to a, uh, a, a double or a character and so on. Difference type indicates the, the difference between two iterators. So you can do basically subtraction to get a value that indicates how far along in your range a particular iterator is. It's mimicking the subtraction operation on pointer arithmetic. Pointer is the same data type as the value type is, and reference is a reference to the same data type as the value type. So pointer is just basically the value type pointer, and reference is reference to the value type. And generic algorithms can often use these traits to optimize their behavior or decide what will work or what won't. 
So here's uh, some examples of how to do this. This is just reiterating what we've seen before. So we're going to make ourselves a double, a list of doubles. We're going to print them out. Then we're going to get an iterator using the iterator trait here. And then we're going to go ahead and store a value through that iterator. So we're going to store the value 100.1 in the first location in that particular list. Uh, then we're going to print the contents out. And then down here, we're going to show a bunch of other different types. You can see how we can use const iterator to get a const iterator to the underlying element. And we're also going to show how you could get a value, use value type to get the value that's pointed to. So we can refer to all these things in a very generic way. Now, you could always do something like this. If you want to get the const iterator, you can just use auto. That's another way to do the same thing. Of course, you have to rename it if you want them both to be there. And likewise, you could also do this in order to be able to get to the value type. And notice that if you have the const iterator, you can't assign to it. So just underscoring again that if something's const, it can only be used as an R value, as is, is up here when we assign the local variable D to what the const iterator points to, but you can't use it as an L value. So just underscoring that one more time. Okay, so that's illustrating how the various traits can be used to write generic code. So that's kind of cool. Now we have one more little piece in this introductory part. This just kind of summarizes the pros and cons of iterators in general. So they give you this way of accessing all your containers in a common form. You can have these traits that come along with everything. So it's easy to tell how to make an iterator for any given class. And you can use this in a very cool generic programming way, as we'll see many times throughout the course. You can think of iterators as very limited stateful pointers because they have to keep track of where they are and whatever they're iterating over. And you can dereference them to get the values that they're pointing to. And an iterator can be a pointer or a class, which makes it very powerful to write algorithms that don't know and don't care whether they're working on native types or some type of class-based type. However, not everything with iterators is going to be um, rainbows and unicorns. They don't provide range checking. So if you're not careful, you can end up stepping past the end of a, of a container and things will blow up. And I think I have some examples of that. Uh, different types of containers support different types of iterators by default. So you can't always change the underlying container type without changing the code. I will show you that as well. If you have an iterator that is referencing certain types of data structures, particularly vectors, and the vector grows or changes, it either shrinks or grows, the iterator that's pointing into one of its elements may become invalid because whatever it was pointing to has either gone away if you resize the vector to make it smaller, or perhaps another what thing that could have happened is that it's regrown or it's grown, and so the memory has been reallocated. So in all those cases, you have to be wary of pointer or iterator invalidation. And I guess sort of in a nutshell, uh, iterators have the same pros and cons as pointers. So they, uh, they, they let you work in things very efficiently, and it's a convenient, familiar syntax for a lot of developers who know C at least, but you can also go off the edge of the abstractions and um, modify things you're not supposed to get access to. So let's take a look at some of this stuff just to make it concrete. We're going to define a type def, which is just another name for a, a type, to be a vector of long initially, and we call that container. And we're gonna make ourselves an empty container. So we have a container with zero elements in it. We're gonna get ourselves a const iterator to the beginning of this thing. And then we're gonna do something really foolish. We're going to exceed the bounds of the iterator. So you can see here that there's nothing in this container. And yet we're gonna go ahead and dereference the iterator and try to print its value. And we're gonna use a, a do while loop. Do while loops only makes sense if you're guaranteed that there's a value to access before you do the while check at the bottom. Uh, probably much better to do a while loop than a do while loop here, but I'm just using this to illustrate how to get the code to blow up. 
So this, this code will either fail silently, which is not a good thing because it's scribbling over memory that it shouldn't scribble over, or it's going to blow up. Either case, it's not a good thing. Then we can go ahead and sort the container. Well, obviously this is not going to make a result because it's going to be a container that has no elements, but at least it'll compile. So let's go ahead and compile the code. You can see that it doesn't give you any value, but the problem is that we've scribbled over memory. And um, were you to run this with Valgrind, you would discover that there's a memory leak. And I'll, I'll probably go do that in just a second, just for kicks to show that to you. Um, but before I do that, let me show you something else. If I come up here and I change my container from vector of long to list of long, then all of a sudden, when I compile this, it, it shouldn't compile. Um, and that's because a list is not a random access, uh, a, a list is not a, it's not a container that has random access iterators. It has bidirectional iterators. And therefore it doesn't work with the sort algorithm because the sort algorithm expects to have random access iterators, but a list doesn't provide that capability. So that obviously is not going to compile. So let's change that back. And now it at least will compile, but it'll still have a bug. So what I've got here is my Ubuntu Linux running, and I'm going to run Valgrind for you. So first, what we have to do is we have to say, let's take a look at the name of the file. We have to say CMake, CMake list, and this will go ahead and pull in the information necessary to to create make files. So now, if you take a look, you can see we have a make file. So now, if I say make, it'll go ahead and make the code. So now it's building it. And then down here, we have a uh, program, which is called, I think it's called something like 42C. And you can see it, it blows up. Well, why does it blow up? Let's go ahead and run Valgrind. And you can see why it blew up, because it's basically telling us that uh, it was trying to access memory that was in fact, not allocated, which is exactly what we're doing. So just for kicks, let's try to do something here. Let's try to do G plus plus minus G GDB main dot C. And let's go ahead and call this thing. Um, let's just leave it A dot out. So it should go ahead and compile it. Let's run it. All right, blows up as we thought it would. Val grind. And now that I compiled it with the the flag dash ggdb that puts additional debugging information in the object code and as you can see here what it'll do is it'll tell me on line 62 of my program that's where it blew up so if i do cat uh, minus n main.cpp and we pipe it through less and we go look at line 62 you can see yes indeed line 62 is dereferencing that that iterator that we got here that points to a zero size container. And because we didn't check whether iterator was not equal to C.N before we checked and did the dereference, this code is going to blow up. Now, what's interesting here was that this code blew up when I ran it on Linux, but when I ran it on Windows, it didn't blow up. So Windows is clearly actually not doing us any favors by not blowing up when we're dereferencing null pointers, because those are good things to know about while you're testing your code and you don't really wanna discover this at runtime when you switch platforms to some other environment. So that was just an example of using Valgrind. I find Valgrind very helpful and I hope you'll get a chance to use it as well.